Good evening. My name is Jaap Guldemond, as just mentioned, I'm a director of exhibitions and chief curator at the Arie Film Museum in Amsterdam, which is a museum that's sort of tried to focus on the intersection of film and, uh, and video and visual art, actually. I'm very happy that you've been asking me to have an artist talk with Tao. And um, I'm just curious if many of you have already seen the exhibitions or not? Partly, no, mostly not. Okay, because probably those who, of you who have seen the exhibition would have discovered the enormous wealth in different media that Tao is using. And I thought uh, it's from it's from uh, painting to to video, or from sculpture to textile, or it's from a sort of more modernist forms to more traditional Vietnam, Vietnamese uh, films. It's from archival material to lacquer work. So there's a, a, a richness of, of of different media, and I thought probably it's interesting to start talking a little bit with um, Tao, where it all comes from. So probably. Um, so actually, I want to ask you, so how come, or where does this come from, this richness of your media? And probably you can start to introduce a little bit how you start making art in Vietnam. Um, thank you so much for accepting the invitation to have a conversation with me. And uh, I am a Vietnamese artist that based in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, and uh, Reincarnations of Shadows is my first solo exhibition in Italy. Uh, gracefully, thanks to the curation of uh, Lucia and Fiametta, and uh, to talk about my education and how I become an artist. Um, I uh, live and grow up in Vietnam, and I went to the Fine Arts University in um, Ho Chi Minh City from 2005 to 2008, where I have a major in lacquer painting. Um, so the, the art school in Vietnam uh, is based on a quite uh, conventional model that follow the Eco de Buza that was opened in Hanoi in the 1920s. So with this uh, model, the, the school only teach uh, painting and sculpture. There's no photography, no filmmaking, or no other new media. Um, and also, it's also devised to um, apartments such as oil painting, lacquer painting, and silk painting. And uh, the image you saw on the screen is one of the assignments that most old students who follow this kind of education has to uh, went through is field trips. So every uh, every year, the student will spend at least one month and maximum two months to go to another place. It could be usually within the within Vietnam, but usually in the countryside or remote places. And the students are supposed to depict the life and the environment of this space in a, let's say, accurate way. Um, so from my own observation, I think it's a combination of both. Um, the Eco de Buza tradition and also social realism, let's say, because you're supposed to go to a place and you depict the farmer or the workers there in a rather um, accurate way. And, uh, and may I ask this social re realism, as you call it, is that still like that or is that during your studies or how did it? I think the Enjoy. education still have this this kind of um, influence, but nowadays the artists don't use that language in their work anymore. I think maybe in the 60s, in the 70s, but when I was there, they still touch like that, but they no longer practice like that. So the teaching and the practicing is a bit apart. Um, and then uh, there's this slide where I want to share a bit about my first experiment with um, 
uh, let's say, video art or performance art. So uh, Vietnam in the middle of the 2000s started to be exposed to have some international exposure. So we, uh, uh, the moment was when we have a renovation in two, uh, 1986, when we have, we started to have a free market with, uh, let's say, um, uh, single ideology, a one party policy, but an open market. And in 1995, we all normal, normalized our relationship with the United States. And in the 2000s, many artists with Vietnamese origin started to come back to Vietnam to practice art. And uh, the first work that I saw in one of the space that run by artists was a, a piece by Bruce Norman, uh, stamping in the studio. And uh, it was in a small apartment, but I, I have to say I was very intrigued by that experience. And even though I don't carry it in my practice, but it was one of my early influence on contemporary art. And was this, this experience made you to decide, because after your studies in Vietnam, you first, I think, went to Singapore, but then later on you applied to Chicago to do your studies. Was it mainly also based on this experience of opening up to a different way of uh, making art, or how did it work out for you? Um, so the art education in the academy in Vietnam is five years, but I only do three years. And then I left, and I did one year in Singapore. And I think Singapore was a kind of a um, middle passage to me, um, because I I um, I actually intrigued by the the art that I see there, especially the practice of a a group called the Artist Village, and most of them work with performance and um, it was a very uh, smooth transition and it's kind of prepared me for the journey in in Chicago uh, but during these three places I always choose painting as my major because it's give me my comfort zone but it's also I feel it's the medium that I'm most comfortable with but how did it, uh, because I can imagine uh, coming from Vietnam, then going to Singapore, and once arriving in Chicago, you told me earlier that there, in a way, you discovered, uh, after Bruce Nam and then, but you discovered media art and film, and how did it work out for you? I mean, you darkly started to, to work yourself in that medium, or you still stick to the painting? How was that in Chicago? So in Chicago, my major was uh, also in painting, but I, I have to say I was slightly unhappy with the uh, mm, the context of American painting, let's say, if I can generalize, generalize it that way. But um, American painting at that time, or more in general also from the history of American painting? or more what had been made at that time when you were at, at Chicago? So it was like in the late 2000, like from 2010 to 2014 when I was in, in Chicago. And I, I feel like I need the time to comprehend the works that um, most institutions in America consider very good works. Yeah. Uh, so I, as a student, I have this, uh, like not understanding the language. Like if you speak French and if you speak French very nicely, but still I cannot speak and understand, it will be a kind of a mistranslation. Uh, but when I see like video art in the museum or, because in Vietnam, I didn't have the access to uh, personally consider for me good cinema. Yeah. But in Chicago, they have a, a cinema just for experimental film. And they have an archive and online resources are also much available. I 
um, have the chance to approach to the things that I personally feel good cinema to me. And what do you mean with experimental uh, film? Is this feature films experimental or more like a visual artist working with film? Um, What's for you experimental American cinema? Because of course there's this 60s and 70s with people like Bruce Conner and Paul Sherritt and all those people, which are so, so to say the experimental American filmmakers. Do you mean these people or you mean more like experimental uh, feature filmmakers? I think more like, uh, let, from what my understanding is more like experimental shots. Yeah. Like uh, Jonas Mekas or Stan Brackett. Yeah. Or the one I like very much is Bruce Bailey. Yeah, Bruce uh, Bailey. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So these, these are the real experimental American filmmakers. Yeah. And actually, to pass to the exhibition here. So actually, in the end, you. So also started to make video work for video installations. And one of the installations here is a major installation. It's called Mute Grain from 2019. And it's a three channel black and white film. And it's there you using a lot of different materials even in the video. And probably it makes sense to for the people who haven't been in the exhibition yet to tell a little bit the story of this film and the background of this work. Oh, um, so, uh, Mood Grain, which is uh, showing in a reincarnation of shadows in the loop with another video called First Friend Chris Soleil. Um, Mood Grain, I made the video in 2019, but the, um, let's say, the, the urge or the inspiration already started as a child. Uh, as a child, I uh, was always very interested in literature and also uh, history. And uh, uh, I spent a lot of time just reading. And I found uh, in one of the uh, short story of a writer called To Hoai. So he was one of the very well-known writer for children books. But he wrote about his experience as a very young man, experienced the famine of 1945, and the story was very graphically depicting what happened. Uh, but then I uh, carried that memory growing up, but during my education, I didn't see or uh, hear any uh, official records in history books, for example, discussing this event. So in, in 2019, with the support of the Saja Art Foundation, I, I shot a film in 2017 and 2018. I, I did a road trip to the north of Vietnam where this famine happened. And it was not officially recognized, but uh, people say that uh, the loss was two million people, and it happened during the Japanese occupation. And uh, one of the most popular idiom from that time is uproot rice, grow jute, which you will see I use that as the medium in both the sculpture and the painting. And because the this was the story that um, for the Japanese occupation, so they forced the Vietnamese farmers to grow jute instead of rice. And that caused a famine, or not? Is that right? Um, yes, that's what people said, but this is not officially recognized. So I wouldn't say it's absolute truth, yeah. but this is the information that I receive. Yeah. And I, uh, I know an, a historian who, who had the grant from a Japanese researcher. It's a small grant of 10,000 US dollars, and he went to the own people houses to record using the cassette player because that was in the early 90s their uh, testimonies of the event so i used these te testimonies i selected the one that i feel personally related to transcribe it into the video and it was reenacted using young uh, actors and actresses 
and and um, you're using in this 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 three part video film you're using a lot of air you don't only use a new footage but you also use archival material you use photographic material you even use sort of painting on top of the archival material so you use uh, a lot of different uh, media again even within this film but then i'm interested to hear in the end, there, because there's so many, so many different fragments, how do you, in the end, compose a work like that? How does that work? Because it seems to be a very open narrative structure. Is that right, or how, how does that work with you? Sure. I like very much the method of uh, pairing uh, archival uh, materials, such, such as uh, sound or image. For example, in Mood Grand, I use the archival images from a, a photographer named Võ An Ninh, and it is believed that this only photographs from the famine was from him. But then I, I feel like as a visual artist, it's not my position to document the event. So I, I have the need to painted over the archival images with my own interpretation. And I use this method many, many times in different video works. Yeah, but, but so, uh, so you choose very deliberately all those material, but then of course you start to compose and you keep to the narrative that you want to tell or you keep it open. How does that work? Because it seems very open to me. So you deliberately seems not to really tell a story from A to B. Of course there is, but it's very open, which I like a lot. You do that on purpose, or how does that? Uh, let's say I think in the uh, in the beginning it was not on purpose, uh -huh. but the more I work, the more I feel like uh, uh, it could become uh, a language, because uh, mm, it's according to what I feel a good work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's also, also in, intu intuitively, actually, that you choose, select, yeah. Yeah. And even uh, apart from this three channel video work, there's a sort of ongoing series of watercolors on silk. Mm. And how does this connect to each other? Or how do you try to connect these different uh, media to each other? Uh, sure. Um, I think the. The, the decision to pair different mediums um, is actually very influenced by my uh, two years of mentorship under the American uh, performance and video artist, Joe Jonas. So I, uh, I was a re recipient of a grant called the Rolex Mentor and Protégé, and they supported me to be with a mentor and my mentor was uh, John Jonas. And from 2016 and 2017, um, I didn't know her work before at all, I have to admit. Um, and she selected you or you selected her? <laughs> First you selected her and then she selected you or? <laughs> uh, the mentor selects the protégé, yeah, okay. but the protégé of course knows that the artist will be the mentor. Yeah. And I think uh, at the beginning I didn't know her work, but I know I share her her interest in certain aspect of Japanese culture and Japanese cinema. So I feel like there could be a conversation, yeah. and I uh, didn't expect it could be such a good match. <laughs> and I have to say I learned a lot from her practice of combining mediums. Yeah. I think actually she had a huge exhibition here, isn't it? In the okay, so that's probably therefore they, you've been able to be here. Um, and just to go back for a little to this uh, mute grain, so you were talking about the Japanese occupation and the uh, the Japanese forced uh, Vietnamese farmers to grow jute instead of um, of rice. And then another major work in this exhibition is the sort of curtain, so to say, that you made out of jute. Um, which really makes a division in in the, the big space, and you are able to cross it, and it makes a beautiful sound. 
Uh, how did you come to make this work? And is it directly connected to this mute grain or is it more on itself? Um, it is connected to mood grain. The first version I made in uh, also in 2019, first in the Rock Bun Museum in Shanghai. But I think uh, I have to say that I am very happy with this um, edition of the piece. Um, thanks to the support of my curators. Um, uh, because we have uh, explored the concept of uh, reincarnation of shadows, this idea of reincarnations and this idea of shadows, and how the exhibition can focus on the idea of uh, fluidity or se semi-transparency and how to build uh, walls and divisions without physical walls and without physical divisions. Yeah. And I think uh, architecturally, the truth help me to do that, yeah. but also conceptually it ties to the video piece. Yeah. But you deliberately didn't use bamboo, for example, though it has to be jute for this work, for this sort of curtain. I mean, has it a, so more also like more symbolic meaning? I could use bamboo, but the, I think the symbolic meaning is not something that is crucial but it helps me to not getting lost in the crazy maze of information that I collect for my work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. And um, another um, major work here is another video work. It's called uh, Becoming Alluvium 2019, and it's a single screen work. And in this work also, a main protagonist of the work is the river Mekong. Uh, which is also being part of the, of course, in the mute grain. And it has a beautiful, it has like three stories in a way. And can you elaborate a little bit on this story? Because I think it's interesting people, how this sort of legends and how you use literature. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, Becoming a Luvium is a single channel screen and it's uh, also show here in the exhibition. And I w it was made uh, in with the support of the Hans Nepkins Art Foundation. And in that video, I kind of uh, write my little manifesto about how I perceive moving image as the reincarnation. And uh, reincarnations in the, uh, let's say in the Vietnamese context, or in the countries with the context which is influenced by Hindu or Buddhist approach uh, is that uh, when a person pass away, he or she has the possibilities to transform into different animate or inanimate uh, entities, such as a rock or tree or animals or demon. Um, for me, uh, the reincarnation is more like a conceptual approach to image making, because I feel like uh, the, the possibilities of moving image when it is presented in different settings is has the ability to have a new life. So in uh, Becoming Alluvium is literally the story of a two siblings that pass away during a broke of a hydropower dam. It was based on a true event that happened in Laos in 2018 and how they reincarnate into a water hand scene or to the Irrawaddy Dolphin uh, to the several layers and finally become a Khmer princess and finally become a deal that evaporates into the Mekong River. And is this like, you call it Irrawaddy uh, dolphin? Ir Irrawaddy dolphin. Ir Ir Irrawaddy, because to me that sounds really like sort of magical uh, fish, but it's it does exist in real, the Irrawaddy, it's or a, is it a, more the name of a legend? It's an actual fish that is kind of going extinct very fast due to environmental changes. Yeah, and in this work, you there are like three reincarnations, yeah? and you use different uh, literary sources again, actually here. So the first is Marguerite Dura, if I'm right, with the Lama, the lover. The second, I think, is Italo Calvino with the Cita, La Cita Invisible, which of course everyone knows by heart here in Italy. <laughs> And the third is this beautiful Khmer legend. Can you elaborate on this Khmer legend? Because it's a beautiful story, I think. Yeah. 
I use the mixed sources also from uh, the poems from Tagore, uh, the Indian poet, yeah. and also uh, Duras and uh, Italo Calvino. And the last part is from a Khmer folktale that was translated into a collection of Khmer folktales that published in Vietnamese in the 70s. Um, and uh, I, I think this kind of pairing of um, so-called well-known literary work, uh, works to, uh, in comparison with the source that are considered less well-known is something that I really like to do um, because I see the beauty and the importance of Duras or Calvino, of course, but I feel these stories from a very local context is equally important. So this is a very sort of deliberate mix of different literary sources, eh? what you find in your work quite quite often, actually, eh? using also like oral histories, mixing it with more nowadays uh, narratives and whatever. And um, talk about this um, reincarnations. Eh? You once said that um, the video or film images, uh, you see them as a cascade of reincarnations. And what do you mean with that? I mean, you just explained it a little bit, but more literally, you connect it to the video or the film images. How does that work? Um, yes. Uh, I see them, uh, I, I wrote, I think I wrote in my publication, Moonsoon Melody, as I perceive them as a cascade of re reincarnations. Is I think it's my attempt to, to combine and mixing uh, medium and sources. Um, I I feel like uh, in the kind of subject matter that I am interested in, the kind of uh, weaving of narrative, they are considered very complex. Mm -hmm. So this um, philosophical or spiritual approach to the idea of reincarnation kind of help and guide me um, in order to have a, let's say, a coherent body of work, but not in any chance simplify or didactic. Yeah. That is my attempt. Okay, <laughs> good. And talking about his reincarnations, you also once said that you're at an important uh, sort of meeting or you get to know the work of Apichatpong Birasetaku, who also had an exhibition here, I thought. Amazing one. So what? Yeah, because you said that that was a sort of very important uh, meeting with him or with his work. What what exactly attracted you in his work, and what brought it to your own work? Actually, um, uh, unlike John Jonas, I didn't know uh, Peter Pan uh, personally. I discovered his work before John Jonas. I discovered his work when I was in Chicago. And as I mentioned before, I was a little bit confused with the, let's say, the American approach to painting making. And when I saw his film, it was like a relief for me because I was in a very cold city and his film is full of lush landscape. So it's kind of a literal... Felt at home, in a way. <laughs> ...action at first. <laughs> and and I also feel like he can come by, let's say, a narrative from a local context without exoticizing them. Because I, uh, as a Vietnamese, I, I feel like uh, at that moment when I was a student, I feel if I make work about my country, yeah. I will um, be slightly politically incorrect because I talk about Vietnam, you know, and this is like, I shouldn't talk about Vietnam. <laughs> but I, I think Api Chapon works uh, beautifully deal with the local context yeah. and give a universal voice. So I can borrow this approach and this gave me the confidence to work with the subject matter that I am truly interested in. Yeah, and and this is it the same that he sort of 
give you the confidence to work with your own history and the Vietnamese, uh, more like Vietnamese folkloristic of, of myths, whatever. Is this also that help you to use, for example, part of becoming alluvium is also like a series of lacquer work, yeah, what you talked a little bit earlier on, so that you dare to use this, I think for many of us, very Asian tradition of lacquer work to combine this with the yeah. video? Yes. Um, I was trained as a lacquer artist, but I didn't practice the craft for quite a while. So it w uh, the piece that you sh see in the exhibition is a collaboration with my partner, uh, artist Trương Công Tùng. Yeah. And uh, I, I also decided to use lacquer as a, concept a conceptual approach because uh, if you uh, look carefully, all of the painting mediums are water-based. They are watercolor or gouache or lacquer. Um, and uh, because to work with lacquer, it, you add layers and then you have to put them under water and use the sandpaper to remove the layers that you painted on. So in relationship to the concept of alluvium, when the water bring the sediment and the resources to the land, and when the water kind of mm, go away, it remains the alluvium, but it's also wash away some sediment. And this is a kind of a, a cyclical seasonal process. And I think it's conceptually very similar to the practice of the craft of lacquer. Yeah. So I think it's also a conceptual bias. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really nice. And, and actually, if you see this whole body of works that you've made so far, of course, you again uh, talking about source to sources. You use historical events like the sometimes history of Vietnam. Um, it's quite a lot of different uh, sources, but. You also um, address sort of nowadays issues, eh? you, you like the ecological, e ecological disasters that are also happening to the Mekong, but of course worldwide. And you are talking about food scarcity. So, just to put it very bluntly, uh, what do you want to tell actually with your work? You want to also to address these kind of issues of what's your position as an artist within these nowadays issues combined with your Vietnamese background? I, I think the question is a bit grand <laughs> to answer. Um, I, I, I feel as a, a citizen of the earth, I concerns about what's happening, uh, but my position, I cannot uh, do change or rapid actions. So uh, the content of the work, it does reflect uh, my, let's say, political concerns, but it's really not to uh, depict or illustrate these concerns. Yeah. I just use this story as a, a mean, and I personally feel for me the, the medium is more important than the message. Yeah. Um, so that's what I try to convey. Yeah, and because, but on the other hand, you talk about sort of ecological responsibility, but this is not like taking a sort of activist uh, point of view, but more for yourself. Or um, it could be a, a let's say a selfish approach. Um, I do believe in activism, but I I personally don't think that my artwork kind of. Uh, respond to this direction, but I respect activists and I agree with them. Yeah, and is this, just to to know a little bit more about the concept, is your position as an artist in Vietnam is sort of a role that many Vietnamese artists take, or is there like other visual artists that you're interested in in Vietnam having a stronger position in those uh, things, or? Uh, can you rephrase the question? It's like the position, uh, you say, okay, for me, the, the medium is more important as the message, but I can imagine that in nowadays, actually there's a lot of Vietnamese art uh, uh, being showed uh, everywhere in a way. Is this position that you take, is this 
what you see with fellow artists in Vietnam, or is this very particularly your position? Um, I think personally, I closely observe the practice of my peers, especially the one who, let's say, within the same context, like it could be Vietnamese overseas that have a Vietnamese heritage but was born in in the US or in Europe or Vietnamese but educated mm -hmm. in a Western art context like me um, because we kind of have the same code, the same language and we could understand the work easier. Uh, I, I, I think uh, I don't have a position in any uh, ideological or geographical uh, medium or, yeah. I, I think my approach is fully personal. Yeah, okay. But th actually that brings me to another work in the exhibition, which is probably the most recent project that you've been here. Right? It's a work also partly produced by the Anger Bikoka, and it's called The Incarnation of Shadows. And it's, again, a multifaceted work. And it seems in this work, which is, again, a video work, has two screens, but they're put vertically, that in that work you seem to connect yourself to, I have to pronounce it well, Dim Fung Ti. Perfect. Perfect now. <laughs> we exercised on that a little bit. Dim Fung Ti. <laughs> a female Vietnamese modernist artist from the last century, living between the 1920s and 2002. She's born in Vietnam. She's educated in Vietnam, I think, as a dentist. But then she moved to Paris, to France, early 50s. And there she discovered sculpture and she turned to be uh, making modernist sculpture. But it seems that if you not only, if I want to know how you discovered this work, but also um, how you connect to her work and probably how you connect probably to her life as well. So my uh, first experience with her work is during the dinner with my parents. Um, my family doesn't have an artistic background, but my father likes to read so he shared with me what he reads and he shared about this particular figure of the woman sculptor Tim Phum Thi who create a very interesting sculp sculptures using uh, her invented system of seven models moduns that is like her own alphabet and it was in 2010 that I saw her work for the first time in a house museum in Hue, which is in the kind of middle of Vietnam, and it was the own capital of the country. Um, and I was actually intuitively very attracted to her way of combining materials and forms in a very graceful way. And I think the work, Reincarnation of Shadows, is I have to perceive one of my most personal work in the exhibition. And I also feel it has a slightly different approach to other moving image works in the exhibition because most of the other moving image works started or focus on a tragic event, uh, whatever is a broken a dam or the destruction of a theater or a famine. But this particular work is more of a very private conversation between me and a figure that is no longer around but still have multiple ways to reincarnate. But isn't it because you said there is no tragic event, but actually if you see her life, it's quite tragic in a way, because moving in the early 50s when Vietnam was still colonized by the French and having this war, she moved to Paris and actually then she started, as far as I understood from your work, she started to be interested in sculpture because of not being able to see all those terrible images 
Yeah, because the big tragedy is, of course, this war was going on from the early 50s, actually, until uh, the 70s. So don't you call that a tragedy then? Or do you see that differently? Because I see big tragedy, actually, in the work. Um, I, uh, it's a tragedy, but it's also a privilege. Because I perceive her personal life as extremely privileged. Because she, uh, in the time when she was growing up in that city of Hue, is extremely uh, conventional and very Confucius. So woman is not supposed to have an education. But she went to the medical school and she graduated with dentistry and she got a doctorate in dentistry in France. And she joined, and when she still in Vietnam, she joined the resistance, the nine years resistance against the French, which ended in the Dien Binh Phu battle in 1945, but she left Vietnam before that happened. So I think um, she was from a very privileged position compared to most Vietnamese women. So this kind of tragedy, is also a privilege. And I personally feel uh, her approach to art making kind of uh, teach me some lessons about how to have a political position because she uh, was pro-communist, let's say. But her art doesn't have anything to do with that. And this is what I found very inspiring. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So you sort of see her as an example in a way for you to be able to make this. But on the other hand, your art really makes use of very Vietnamese traditional forms, cultures, legends. And she's more like pure modernist, according to you. I wouldn't say it's a role model. I wouldn't say that. But I think it's a... Um, a case to learn from, like uh, uh, it's very unique, but it's also universal. Yeah, and because actually she, do you consider her because she, after this uh, discovery from sculpture in Paris in the 90s, she came back to Vietnam and she took all her sculptures with her to, because she had the idea that it belongs to the Vietnamese culture. Um, do you consider her as like a sort of post-colonial artist, to use this terrible word? Or <laughs> I, I don't think, uh, uh, I think she, personally she wants to contribute to her wounded nation. And I'm I think uh, she wants to contribute something to her... Uh, to her nation. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's a deliberate act, but it's also very pure and very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then I'm sort of interested, like with your work, yeah, because dealing so much with Vietnamese history, how is your work uh, received in Vietnam? Is this completely different as it's being received, for example, here in Italy? Or can you s elaborate a little bit on that? Um, I think uh, in Vietnam, because of its particular economy and politi con political context, um, is a, a one-party nation, and there are still censorship for the art, for literature, for cinema. Cinema is under huge censorship, especially literature. I think visual arts is a little bit easier, since uh, I think they perceive that visual art doesn't have doesn't attract that much audience. <laughs> <laughs> so I I think my work is uh, well received within the context of the Vietnamese art community. Um, so I, I think that I am well considered back home, but I think uh, I would never have the, this kind of resources and this kind of institutional support to make exhibition in this scale. In Vietnam, would we be more like yeah. experimental or artist-run and 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 do you have an idea like the reaction of an audience outside of Vietnam, like more like in Europe or America? Does that bring sort of interesting perspectives to your work for you? 
uh, d definitely. Uh, I I think uh, I think in Vietnam because of the lack of training in contemporary art uh, practices in the art educational system, and there's also no public museum that support contemporary art. They are started to have some private um, art spaces that focus on contemporary art, but this is still very small. So when I start making work in Vietnam, I was taught that I like super underground, <laughs> but here I feel it's more well received and audience are very used to this kind of work. Okay, yeah. And then going back once more <laughs> to your position as an artist Vietnam, you also started a sort of art collective called Art Labor. And what are the goals? So what are you doing with this art labor? I would like to know. Um, so with Art Labor, there are uh, three of us, myself, my partner, Trương Công Tùng, and a writer and artist named Alet Quynh An. And we come together since 2014 when we just graduated. And I, the collective at the beginning is um, to satisfy a need for collaboration between different disciplines. So we work with uh, uh, people from various uh, areas, such as uh, doctors, farmers, uh, artisans, and we very focused on the community-based projects and inspired by the landscape of the Central Highlands where Trương Công Tùng grows up. And this is actually where some of my moving image work happened. And this is a land that uh, used to be pristine rainforest, but then now tear up by mostly coffee plantations. Um, so the approach is um, community-based, but also, let's say, have more aspect of activism. So that's more like your ecological responsibility. <laughs> okay. Probably you want to open it to the audience, if there's questions. Well, um, I have a question. Uh, in the show, you, everybody can see uh, there's, there is a strong connection between your painting practice and your film. So I'm curious to know uh, what is exactly the process. Do you start uh, from film and then include, um, include paintings or you start from drawings and then you include them in the film? And how is this complex relation working? Uh, thanks for your question. Um, because I never trained as a filmmaker, um, I have to say that at the beginning, I don't know how to do a film. So I always started with uh, the sketches and the drawings. i more confident with my drawings. Um, so when i intrigued by a subject matter, if it's in a book that I read or a story that I've heard or something that I experienced, I will develop a system of drawings and some of the some of them are figurative and gestural and I will develop them into a script for my videos. Some of them I will keep to make the painting. So that is how I uh, regulate my uh, area of practice. I just have a, a small question, but I think it's it's interesting and it's important because like uh, the majority of your works, especially the video works, uh, they are dated as ongoing, meaning that you keep going back to the 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 work, like uh, re-editing. And I think that it is poetically very interesting, conceptually very interesting, not just because it challenges, for example, uh, the way to collect them, the way to preserve them, but because like, uh, so I wanted to ask you something about, because it's very unique. Not many artists, they keep going to the work 
and uh, they appear in the catalog and in the exhibition as ongoing, which is normally what doesn't happen. You know, like the film is a film that is the cut. So can you please let us know a little bit more about this? Um, I think this kind of idea of an ongoing moving image work or a series of work is kind of relate to also the idea of uh, the reincarnation, that you this constant transformation. And I, I think I am very lucky to be a visual artist in this time because I feel like uh, the possibilities for for visual artists to remake or re-edit or transform their work is a lot easier from what I perceive than a filmmaker, for example, when he or she already released the film in the cinema, it is very hard to come back and make a new version. So artists is so free to do this, and this is something that I wanted to embrace and uh, develop in my own practice. Okay. If that's what, thanks you very much. And there's still time to visit the exhibition. <laughs>